First off, I'd like to thank the, the Algonquin Territory, or the people of the Algonquin Territory, whose territory we're on here today, and thank them for welcoming and allowing us to uh, be here and welcoming you to this territory. My full name is Ariel Tsekwe Durange, and it's a Dene name. And my mom always jokes that she aptly named me because my name in Dene means Thunder Woman, and I'm really loud and I don't shut up. <laughs> so, ask a Chippewan First Nation really is, and what we're up against in Alberta's oil sands region. I like to start off with a quote from one of our former chiefs, former our Chief Archie Cyprian, who stated that the land is the essence of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nations values, culture, and spirituality. And what he's really talking about is the fact that our people rely on the land uh, to be who we are. We refer to ourselves as the Kai Tal Dene Sutlene people, and that means the people of the land, the people of the willow, the people of the Athabasca Delta. And the values of our community are simple. We have a vision that we want to lead a proud, unified, <coughs> and independent First Nation that fosters growth for our members by providing and maintaining opportunities that respect land, water, and culture. That's really important when you understand what's happening in Alberta because what we're seeing is that the very values and the core of who we are is becoming, um, is, is at odds with current development in our traditional territory. Our people were signatories to Treaty No. 8, and it's really important to understand the, what the treaties really meant. For our people, you know, we signed this treaty to guarantee to us the ability to hunt, trap, and gather, and practice our cultural livelihoods as long as the, river, as long as the sun shines and the rivers flow. And a lot of people say these treaties happened so long ago, and people often say things like, oh, why are we still paying for these treaties? But to give you an understanding, our treaty was signed in 1899. 1899, my grandfather was alive. Not my great, great, great distant relative who I didn't know, but my grandfather was alive. This treaty actually has real tangible meaning to many First Nations people across the countries, no matter which treaty regions they come from because our ancestors signed these treaties to look out for the future generations. Further to that, these treaties are entrenched in the Canadian Constitution and the Charter of Rights and Freedom in this country through amendments that were made in 1982. They protect our rights. They accepted that our rights are, are of high paramount in this country, and yet again, what we are seeing is that our rights are at odds with what's happening in Northern Alberta. This is a map of our traditional territory. I have a, don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to skip over that a little bit. Right now, our people's rights, our people's culture, our people's identity is at threat because of this. This is a picture of raw bitumen. Now, you know, what this is, what this is doing to us is it's putting our culture and identity. I said to you, you know, we are the Kai Tal Dene Sulene people. And what that means is we are people of the Athabasca and of the Willow. And this is destroying the Athabasca Delta. We all come from somewhere. We all have places of being which we identify with. If you're German, you're from Germany, or you're Italian, you're from Italy, and so on and so forth. For the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, we are the Ath Athabascan peoples. If you destroy the Athabasca, you destroy the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation. Right now, our traditional territory is being threatened by the largest industrial project on the planet, the Alberta tar sands. This represents the three different deposits, and my community lives in the largest deposits in the Fort McMurray or the Athabasca oil sands, but there's also the Peace Delta and the Cold Lake regions. In every single one of these communities, there are First Nations communities that are bearing the worst consequences of this industrial project. There are communities that live in these regions that have no running water, that are on boil water advisories and have been for years. There are communities that are seeing high levels of cancer, autoimmune diseases, and respiratory diseases at the expense so that Canada can get at this oil. My community, where are we situated? Down at the bottom, you can see a picture, a little blotch, and that's a tailings pond. And we live in the community of Fort Chippewan. Our people live in the community of Fort Chippewan, and we live at the end of at the Athabasca River as it goes into Athabasca Lake. We are downstream. That little blotch, that tailing spawns, they're now quite larger, there's more of them. And what we're seeing is that these tailing spawns are leaching into the river which flows northward into the Athabasca region. 
I use this quote from David Schindler because I really like it. There is nothing on this planet that compares with the destruction going on there. If there were a global prize for unsustainable development, the tar sands would be a clear winner. This is a picture of open pit mine. This is what's happening to our delta. This is what's happening to my people's traditional territory. And in order to mine these tar sands, they have to remove what the industry likes to refer to as overburden. Overburden is something that we like to refer to as the boreal forest. <laughs> Critical habitat for species like bison and caribou and places where our people and our ancestors thrived and fosters our culture and our identity. To date, they have removed 1.4 billion tons of overburden. That's more dirt than was moved for the Great Wall of China, the Suez Canal, the Great Pyramids of Cheops, and the 10 largest dams in the world combined. In order to access, the, in order to process the bitumen, they have to mix it with water. Currently, it can be as high as four barrels of fresh water from the Athabasca region to produce one barrel of water. The annual leases in order to do this are equal to a city of three million people. The rights of industry are taking paramount over the rights of people and largely over the rights of First Nations communities. Remember what I said earlier, we have communities with no running water, on water boil advisories. This is completely unacceptable. In addition, there have been studies that prove that 11 million liters of toxic contaminant are leaching into the Athabasca and Mackenzie Basin every single day. In addition to the open pit mines, we also have a technology called SAG-D, and this is going to take up a large portion of the oil sands, and it actually has a really big footprint. They're superheating uh, water, injecting it to the ground, it's heavily water intensive and heavily energy intensive, and they're using natural gas to do this so that it can extract tar sands and create a series of uh, pipelines across the critical habitat in the region that is fragmenting the critical habitat for many species at risk in the region, including migratory birds, moose, caribou, bison, and what we're seeing is our entire area is going to be annihilated by this type of development. The one was before, this is what the leases will look like. Animals don't cross these pipelines, animals don't go across these well pads because it fragments their habitat. We're talking about massive amounts of land that will be destroyed and species will be declining. This is just to give you an idea. This map is from 2004. This represents almost every multinational oil and gas company in the world. Canada has become a playground for oil and gas companies, and my people's traditional territory is what's being sold. I talked about this. What we're also seeing in addition to the migratory pattern disruptions is the fact that these species are actually becoming contaminated. In 2006, Suncor actually did a test on a moose that someone brought forward because it was all discolored and they found that it had 453 times the acceptable levels of arsenic. So this spurred a whole bunch of studies and to date, the government has not done a peer-reviewed independent study to prove what the toxic contamination levels are in the species in the region. These are species that people rely on. Our people are subsistence people, and they do it for two reasons. One, because it's a part of who we are, and two, because it subsidizes the high cost of living, where in the only store, the, a, a loaf of bread costs $8. And this is not some fancy, you know, whole grain, sprouted, whatever. This is like Wonder Bread, $8. So our people rely on fish, moose, caribou, bison, and when we see that these animals are being contaminated, you know, you put one and one together, and what are we seeing? Elevated levels of disease in our community. And the government likes to state that, oh, it actually has no correlation to development at all. So obviously the impacts are going far beyond the environment in the region, and what we're seeing is that, uh, you know, one of the things that the government says when we, when we talk about the environmental impacts, they say, oh, don't worry, you know what, we're going to fix everything and we're going to put it back and we're going to make it better than it was before because reclamation technologies are so fantastic. <laughs> this is what they like to call equivalent land use capacity. You can't hunt, you can't trap. You can't continue to practice your culture and your identity. Athabascan, Chippewan, First Nation people, we cannot be who we are in these regions and these territories. This is not equivalent land use capacity. 
And to date, it's shameful because this is actually an old stat. I should change it. I just haven't. But it's actually 0.1% now that they've fully reclaimed. They've disturbed over 144,000 square kilometers, and they've managed to reclaim just over one in 50 years. That means for 50 years, our people will have lost access to our land, our culture, and our identity if we allow them to continue to expand as they want to. Just to give you an understanding, I wish this is kind of not a good visual, but just to understand, this is the projection of what they want to do. They want to expand the oil sands by three folds, four folds. They want to go headfirst into suicidal expansion in the tar sands. And in order to do that, they need to develop a series of pipelines that would touch <coughs> coast to coast to coast to coast of Turtle Island, North America, and it would touch every community across this continent. You know, what's interesting is the, the Energy East pipeline isn't on here. And you know why? Because people have been so successful installing the Keystone XL in the south, and installing the Gateway pipeline into the west, and now it's our turn out here in eastern Canada to stall and stop their other proposed pipeline because they're winning. Our people are winning. <laughs> pipelines are directly associated to the expansion of the tar sands in my people's territory. Without these pipelines, they can't expand the way that they want to. So your fight is locked up in our fight. And this gets me to the First Nations rights. Why did I give you a big lecture on treaties? It's quite simple in this country. What we saw uh, in 2012, what year is it, <laughs> uh, was the omnibus bills. We saw the gutting of environmental legislation in this country and it tore down democracy in this country and our ability to put, to put pressure on corporations and industry and government to actually be responsible in the wake of development. We saw the gutting of uh, the Navigable Waters Protection Act where they took the protection from 2.5 million uh, lakes and rivers down to 62 rivers and 93 lakes. How does, what does this have to do with treaty rights? We were promised rights to hunting, fishing, trapping, and gathering. You can't hunt, fish, and trap if there's no environment to do it in. Our treaty rights are paramount in this country, so you cannot negate those rights, even if you try to hide it by doing it in such things as the omnibus bills. So, I thought this was a really cute one. Canada can't hide genocide. It was a, it's a genocidal tactic to try and annihilate our cultures and our people through environmental um, genocide. It really equates cultural genocide. It's the same thing. But our community is challenging this. You know, right now, Shell is one of the biggest multinational oil and gas companies in the world, and they're set to develop and expand in my community's traditional territory. The red zone, right here. My nation has decided and declared that this is a no-go zone. We have literally drawn a line in the sand and we have stated that this is our territory and we will have no expansion in our territory. Um, we've done it for a couple reasons too because if you understand that this isn't just about us, this isn't just about our culture, this range also includes critical habitat for species at risk such as the wood bison and the woodland caribou. These are species that are supposed to be protected by Canada and yet they're allowing licensing for multinational companies to go in there and develop at will. So First Nations rights, what have we done with this? We've utilized our, the foundations of our treaty to challenge and sue Shell Oil for failure to meet past agreements. We've also, done it, we've also challenged the Jack Pine Mine expansion in our traditional territory on the basis that it was affecting and impacting our ability to access our treaty and Aboriginal rights. And this project was actually, oh, go back, sorry. <laughs> this project was actually approved. This project was approved for the, by the federal government under, that it was approved under, certain cir under these circumstances, in the public interest even though they admitted that this project would have adverse effects on the environment, adverse impacts on treaty and Aboriginal rights and land use and culture, and yet they've approved it. So my community has launched a judicial review of that decision and will be taking Canada and Shell to court. You know, 
Um, it's really narcissistic to have a photo of yourself. <laughs> but I like the quote and I'm too lazy to redo just the quote. Uh, you know, I like to end with this quote because I think it's really, really important to understand that, um, I'll just read it first. Our people and our Mother Earth can no longer afford to be economic hostages in the race to industrialize our homelands. It's time for our people to rise up and take back our role as caretakers and stewards of the land. And I just want to wrap up with that because what, it, what I'm seeing by economic hostages is that we've all been prescribed economies. First Nations are putting corners to accept oil and gas as the only economies and livelihoods for our communities, even though we were not a part of developing these economies. We are forced into situations where nations feel like they have no choice but to sign deals with projects that go against the very values and core of who they are and their culture. And I think that this epidemic of what's happening in First Nations communities is spreading across the country with this project. The Energy East pipeline is going to lock all of us into an oil and gas regime that we cannot afford on this planet. And so it's time for our people, all people, to stand together and rise up and take back control of our lives, our economy, and this planet. for coming out on a Sunday night on a, maybe the first spring night and it wasn't the rain everybody was worried about or warned about so thank you so much everyone for being here tonight. I want to thank uh, the, the people of the Algonquin for being on their we're welcoming, welcoming us to their territory. I want to say a big thanks to the local chapter of the Council of Canadians and Ecology Ottawa who've done tremendous work putting this thing together and just to say what an honor it is to be on this panel with Ariel and Andrea and Graham, uh, all tireless workers for um, a more just um, and sane environmental uh, policy in our world. I want to talk a little bit about the impact of Energy East on water. You heard Ariel talking about the impact uh, on water of creating bitumen, of refining bitumen, uh, and the ama enormous amount of water that is used, and then the enormous amount of water that is turn turned into toxic waste. But it is also very dangerous to water when this bitumen is piped through pipelines and sent anywhere, because it's uh, kind of the consistency of cold molasses or peanut butter, and so to move it through pipelines, they have to use chemicals such as benzene, liquid chemicals, to make it move. And so it has a very different consistency and it is much more dangerous if it spills. If there's a spill, it doesn't float on the water the way conventional oil does. It sinks not some of it to the bottom, some of it to a middle layer. And we know from many, um, well, there haven't been so many uh, uh, vitamin spills, but from the ones that have, have already happened, we know that the cleanup is just a, a, an absolute nightmare. In Kalamazoo, Michigan, there was a, a very large spill. It's cost over a billion dollars to, to clean it up, and they still haven't got anywhere near that. It's destroyed the fisheries and the, and the food uh, producing uh, industry in the, in the region. Uh, it's been a, an absolute disaster. And when the pipeline Trans Canada says, well, we're, you know, we're gonna, it's going to be state of the art, first of all, most of it's a converted old pipeline that was never built to carry this stuff in the first place. But even the new part of it is not going to be it, spill-free. There's no such thing. In the first 12 months of the Keystone, uh, the part of the Keystone that has been built, Trans Canada had 12 spills. So it's really important for us to to not believe the, the pipeline company or the government when, when it says that this is spill-proof. Um, Energy East will cross, traverse over 90 watersheds, most of them in the Great Lakes and along the St. Lawrence River, and I'm deeply concerned about what I consider to be the uh, new threat, newest threat to the Great Lakes, and that is extreme energy, from fracking, fracked oil and fracking wastewater to this stuff being piped uh, near the waterways to uh, nuclear waste being buried in deep deposits. We are uh, setting up a new threat to the Great Lakes that are already threatened by invasive species and 
uh, co climate change and over extraction and multi-point pollution. Now we're adding this threat, and the latest threat is that they're going to allow the transport of this bitumen and uh, wastewater from fracking and fracked oil on the Great Lakes, on the St. Lawrence River itself. In fact, the uh, United States Coast Guard just gave the go-ahead to allow the barging and marine transport of wastewater, uh, frac uh, fracking wastewater. Now in our area, and uh, um, Andrea spoke, you saw the, the map, it's going to traverse uh, through Stittsville and North Gore. It's going to cross the Rideau River just south of Ottawa, passing through the Baxter Conservation Area, which is 68 hectares of absolutely gorgeous um, wilderness and basically uh, one of the areas that cleans and purifies our drinking water um, and passed just near Kempville. A single spill would poison uh, Ottawa's water supply and shut down the Rideau River right all the way downtown. And remember, this feeds the canal, which is a UNESCO heritage site. Energy East will pass over highly vulnerable aquifers, including the Oxford uh, Aquifer, and I think we have a visual here, uh, and uh, traverse through ground, uh, groundwater recharge areas. So it's extremely important that we understand the amount of water that this is going to be traversing and um, why it's so dangerous. Why we would put our region and our city in this kind of danger for an export pipeline, and may I remind you, this pipeline is not for an energy, a Canadian energy security plan or for Canadian jobs or to provide Eastern Canadians with Western oil. This is an export pipeline. It is built almost exclusively to make money for the big oil companies from, from the tar sands, most of them foreign owned. Now I want to take a moment to step back and figure out why this is happening because what we learned along the, the route so far is that the pipeline company, the uh, TransCanada, is already retrofitting and starting to uh, hire for the pumping stations uh, along the way when they have not yet got the permit, which tells me that no matter what the National Energy Board finds, the Harper government, which in the, in the end has the right They've, their new legislation says it doesn't matter what the Energy Board says, we will maintain the right to make a final decision. They are turning around and they're going to, it seems clear to me, say yes to this uh, project. Uh, and so they're, they're once more paving the way for the large energy industry in this country, uh, the large uh, global corporations who basically are now setting uh, energy policy for us. Uh, and it's very clear they want to determine energy policy for, for not only years ahead, but maybe decades. And for that, and Ariel spoke to this, they've got the Fisheries Act, only leaving habitat protected in some very specific areas, mostly commercial. The Navigable Waters Protection Act, so means that 99% of all of our lakes and rivers are absolutely unprotected now from any, any of the dirtiest uh, oil or, or toxics on, under, or around them. Uh, and, and the Environmental Assessment Act. And when they did that, there were 3,000 environmental assessments, active assessments that were just dropped. Um, and again, Cabinet has now claimed the right to basically make the final decision here. So basically, what the government is doing at the, at the behest of the pipeline companies and the energy industry is just saying, we're going to clear away any of the regulations, all of what I call the rules and tools that they once had that we perhaps um, it w weren't enforced properly, but certainly existed. When I, I try to explain this to American friends, I say it's like they, they, you, they closed down the Clean Water Act. I mean, it's the equivalent in, in our country. And you know the story with scientists and environmentalists and so on. I mean, basically, they are removing all impediments to an all-out um, petrostate. Um, so we really have to ask ourselves uh, what we're going to do collectively, and I think one of them, and there are many things to do, but one of the most important is saying no to this pipeline and saying no to all of the pipelines, which are the arteries of this beast. And if we can stop the arteries, we can stop the increase in the production of the tar sands and begin a conversion up to a more sustainable energy future. I want to end by reminding us that we are a planet running out of clean water. We were all taught back in about grade six that this wasn't possible. We were all taught, and you all have the image in your mind of that hydrologic cycle with a little drop going around um, that said that we have a, an exact and finite amount of water in the planet and you can't destroy it because it's the same water that was here at the creation of, of the planet. And all of that's true at the level that the water's still here somewhere. But we are polluting uh, 
mismanaging and most importantly displacing water through massive engineering feats. We are taking water from where it's been put by nature and it's needed for a healthy hydrologic cycle and we're moving it to where we can get at it for our own needs. The state of California is a perfect example. They have the water they need for sustainable agriculture. They do not have the water that they are requiring for massive uh, agri agribusiness to send food all over the world and for massive engineering and movement of their rivers and aquifers. What we're doing as a planet, as a species, is that we are pumping up groundwater globally at, at double the rate every 20 years. We're using technology that was only designed in the 1950s, this massive centrifugal uh, bore well technology which turned the US and American and Canadian prairies into these lush areas of, of massive production. Um, until then, we didn't have the capacity to do that, and we're now pumping groundwater, mining groundwater, far faster than it can be replaced by nature. We're also moving massive amounts of land water through huge cities, and if those cities are anywhere near the ocean, we're dumping that water in the ocean as waste. And so we see deserts growing in over 100 countries in the world. And we have what scientists are calling hot stains growing. These are areas of the world that are physically running out of water. They use the term drought, but drought denotes that there may be an end of drought. But when you're coming to the bottom of your water table, that's not drought, that's the end of your water table. Just give you three quick examples. One is that in China, in the 1950s, they, they did a full uh, scoping of, of their major rivers. And the government of China has just put out a statement saying that half of their rivers have disappeared since 1990. They don't know where they've gone. I don't mean polluted, I mean gone. They are gone. Uh, the Ogallala Aquifer, that massive aquifer that moves down the spine of the, the west, through the Midwest of, uh, of the United States and produces all of the food for the U.S. and much of the food for the rest of the world has been so overtaxed, once was the largest in the world, now has 200,000 bore wells going 24-7. And last year, the Department of Agriculture said it will be gone. The Ogallala Aquifer will be gone in our lifetime. They said it's not a case of if, there's no way to stop it now. The exponential destruction has gone that far. Uh, and finally, the Great Lakes. Uh, this study, a global groundwater study on, um, on groundwater takings around the world said that if the Great Lakes are being pumped as mercilessly as groundwater generally, the Great Lakes could be bone dry in 80 years which is an absolutely stunning statistic. And I think when I, when I read that, I thought it should have been on the front page of every newspaper in North America, but it was just kind of stuck in a journal um, that didn't get much play, which I think is astounding. So I guess what I want to say to you is that we are blessed to live in an area with the, the water that we just saw, the, the, the traversing of this uh, pipeline over these beautiful aquifers. We are blessed to live near on rivers that feed the Great Lakes or are fed by the Great Lakes. We are blessed to live in a country that has not yet come to water crisis. And there are people around the world that would give absolutely anything to live where we do and have the access to this pure, clean water coming out of our taps. Let me tell you, that gives us a responsibility. We have a responsibility not to destroy this water, not to allow a third party to come in and threaten the water the way TransCanada would be threatening the water, carrying the dirtiest oil on earth, uh, pumped through the pipes by every known chemical you can name, uh, many of them carcinogens, uh, in, at, on a pipeline that I promise you will spill. I mean, we had somebody in, in uh, North Bay last night that just tabulated the spills, the major spills of this company over the last 20 years, and it was just, it was like, get him off the stage, everybody so depressed, because it was so powerful, his, his, his presentation in terms of just the straight facts. We are going to build a movement you're going to know where this pipeline is because you're going to see the resistance growing everywhere along the line of this pipeline. We are going to build a movement and this movement is going to be very deeply involved um, and taking leadership from, with and taking leadership from First Nations because um, as Ariel said, when you kill all of the environmental regulations, what's left are the treaty rights and it's exceptionally important that we understand the importance of those treaty rights, the importance of the Universal Declaration on the, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Universal Declaration on the Human Right to Water and Sanitation, which we just got in 2010. 
These are very new rights. They're very powerful and important community rights. They're resource rights, and we need to start saying, Stephen Harper, you think you're, you're made of something different. You've come here, and I know what he's come here to do. He's come here to change this country irrevocably, forever, putting in legislation that will take decades to undo. But he can't kill the spirit of a people. And we know that we can do better than this. We know we can build a different kind of economy. We know we can build a different kind of energy future. We know that we can have a sustainable economy and a sustainable environment at the same time. In fact, we know the only way to have a sustainable environment is a sustainable economy. And we are going to stand up and we are going to be stewards of this water. And we are going to say, you cannot build this pipeline. You cannot threaten our beautiful waters with this poison. And we will say like Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings, you shall not pass. I also want to thank the Algonquin people for allowing us to hold this event on their territory today. And thanks to the Council of Canadians and Ariel for coming all this way. Um, and thanks to all of you for, for coming here this evening. My name is Graham Saul. I'm the Executive Director of Ecology Ottawa. We're a grassroots environmental organization working to make Ottawa a leader on environmental issues. Um, my job here tonight is to give you a bit of a sense of some of the things that are happening in Ottawa and to invite you to come in and join us. Uh, before I do, I want to say that while I didn't realize we were going to be tweeting at, at, at Jim Watson, you will find a direct route to your mayor via Twitter. He is a he is a he is a Twitteraholic. I, one of our um, one of our council watch uh, folks the other day. We were sitting in a, a staff meeting, and Kai, who who helps us monitor city council, what we were talking about something that happened at city council, and Kai said, "Yeah, you know, I wasn't sure about that, so I tweeted at the mayor, and then he tweeted and passed me on to the uh, the second in command in city council." I mean, in, in, in the city staff, and then he responded to the, uh, to the tweet within the course of a matter of a couple hours. So it's pretty amazing how hard it is to get a, um, to get a meeting sometimes with some of these people, but you send a, tw a, tw a, tw a tweet, tweet at uh, Jim Watts in Ottawa, and you'd be surprised he's out there listening. So please do. Um, before I tell you a little bit more about what's going on in Ottawa, I want to talk about two things that happened this weekend. The first one, as many of you will know, is that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is releasing its third working group report on mitigation, which means how we can solve the climate problem by reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. This is a report that was prepared by about 1,200 scientists. It was approved and discussed by about 200 governments, meaning including many of the most conservative governments in the world. And it comes to a couple pretty stark conclusions and some reassuring ones as well. One of those conclusions is that we are on course for four to five degrees of global warming unless we take action. And to put that in context, tens of thousands of years ago in the depths of the, of the ice age, when where we're sitting right now was under about two kilometers of sheer ice, the world was on average only five degrees colder. So four or five degrees of global warming is a very different world. But the other conclusion it comes to is that there's still time to take action to reduce emissions and to keep warming below or at 2 degrees Celsius. Some of these scenarios show that between now and the middle of this century, if we want to do so, if we want to take action to keep global warming below 2 degrees Celsius, which is what the... Uh, which is what the world's governments have declared as a dangerous tipping point around or, or a dangerous level of climate change, even though many would argue that level is already dangerous. We're going to need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 40 to 70 percent over current levels by, uh, by 2050. So the challenge is there. The danger is real, it's measurable, and the challenge is there. The course of action is clear. The good news is that the same report found that diverting hundreds of billions of dollars from fossil fuels into renewable energy and cutting energy waste would shave just 0.06% off expected annual economic growth rates of 1.3 to 3%. Um, so what we're talking about is 
an investment that will allow the world to continue to grow at 1.3 to 3 percent per annum and would result in only a 0.06 reduction in existing growth rates. And that is not including the benefits such as reduced costs related to, uh, related to the reduction of, uh, of air pollution. So on the one hand, the message is quite stark, and you're hearing a lot of quite stark messages here. We have a serious problem on our hands. Four or five degrees of global warming is a, is a, is a very catastrophic situation. On the other hand, the message is quite hopeful that there are, in fact, things we can do. That the challenge is very much within our capacity to deal with if we start acting now. And the sooner we start to act, the easier it will be the less expensive it will be, and the fewer people who will die, the fewer species who will go extinct, and the, and the, le the, le the less we will be sacrificing the well-being of our children and grandchildren in the interest of business as usual here at home today. I think we all know what ultimately we need to do right now when it comes to climate change, right? We have a problem. The problem is basically that burning oil, coal, and gas is releasing greenhouse gas emissions and this is heating up our atmosphere, it's serving like a blanket around the world that is heating up our atmosphere and that's causing a variety of problems, including sea level rise, severe weather events, etc., etc. And the more we do this, the bigger the problems become until perhaps we reach a tipping point and things get out of our hands. And though, so, so the solution is very clear, we transition away from our dependence on oil, coal and gas and we ramp up renewable energy, energy efficiency and conservation. At its base, it's quite a simple calculus. But what we do right now, we find ourselves in a country where we're doing the exact opposite. Our federal energy policy is actually phasing out the only, federal, the only major federal energy programs designed to support the expansion of renewable energy. We are phasing out the only major federal programs designed to support energy efficiency. And we are actively promoting a radical and reckless expansion of the tar sands. We are actually going into other people's jurisdictions, places like California and the European Union, and we are trying to sabotage clean fuels policies because we're afraid they're going to hurt our ability to sell dirty oil. So this is quite a serious situation in terms of an energy policy at a federal level that has become ugly and reckless and that does not represent us in a very extreme way. But the reality is there are countries out there that are trying. There are even oil producing, cold, sparsely populated countries like Norway that are actually trying to solve this problem. And there are other countries like Germany where not so long ago on a Saturday more than 50% of their energy came from solar, pan solar power over the course of that day. And the difference between them and us is that they're trying. Germany is not some southern sun oasis that has all this, all this solar power that we do not. The difference is they've identified a problem and they're setting out to solve it. So it's not all despair. We look around us and we sometimes forget that there is in fact real evidence of progress happening every day around us and that we have to remember that 60% of people in the last federal election voted for parties with much more substantial and, and proactive energy policies than the one we currently have today. I also want to tell you about something that was alluded to earlier on today that happened in Kitty Map yesterday. So here's a town of 4,300 people, a town that will probably gain about 180 jobs if the Gateway Project moves forward. And here's a town that decided that they were going to do a referendum to decide whether or not they wanted the, they wanted the Gateway Project to flow through their, uh, through their town and, and tankers to go out to the coast. Enbridge piled in money. They hired paid canvassers to go door to door and the people in that town responded by going door to door themselves. They pushed back, they fought, and yesterday there was a referendum where more than 60, almost 60% 60 of people said no to the Gateway Pipeline. And 75% of people in that town voted. That's 25% that's more than voted in the last municipal election. So what we saw in Kitty Mat is not an isolated incident. What we saw in Kitty Mat is a reflection of the leadership that we're seeing 
from First Nations across the West Coast, represented here today by Ariel, and thank you very much for being here, Ariel. What we're, see what we're seeing in Kitty Mat is a reflection of the leadership that's being shown by towns and villages across the city, across the country, that are taking action, that are standing up. We are seeing what is in many ways a continental movement developing in, re in relation to these pipelines. And the Energies Pipeline is only the latest. And the Energies Pipeline is existing because those other grassroots movements are succeeding. And this is a pipeline. <laughs> and keep in mind, this is a pipeline that is larger than the Keystone Pipeline. This is a very big pipeline that is larger than any, any other pipeline currently being constructed right now. This is a pipeline that if you were to only look at the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the harvesting of the oil, not the actual burning of the oil, just the harvesting of the oil, this pipe, the oil that flows through this pipeline will produce more greenhouse gas emissions than the coal plants that Ontario is currently in the process of shutting down. So while Ontario today is taking action, the largest act to fight greenhouse gas emissions in Canadian history by shutting down its coal plants TransCanada is proposing to drive a pipeline through our community that will create emissions that are equivalent to those very coal plants being shut down. And that's the fundamental story that's happening in Canada right now. We cannot do our fair share to fight climate change and allow the tar sands to expand as they're currently projected to expand. This is a reckless and irresponsible and ultimately unethical agenda we need to turn it around and get our energy, federal energy policy under control. And it starts here. In the same way it starts with small alliances in Nebraska who are trying to protect their Oglala Aquifer and First Nations and communities across the West Coast who are saying no to the, uh, to the Enbridge pipeline. It starts at the grassroots level. It's in communities like Ottawa where people stand up. These are massive global issues but the resistance is local. And that's what we're trying to do in Ottawa. Over the next three, over the next 18 months, we're gonna have three elections in the city. Right, at the end of this year, we're gonna have a municipal election. Probably within a matter of a couple months, we're gonna have a provincial election. And by the end of next year, we're gonna have a federal election. So the time is now for us to be talking to our elected leaders and to candidates about where they stand on these issues. From the municipal government, we want to see all of our city councillors and the mayor stand up and say, no, we do not want this pipeline. We want to see the city do a risk assessment of what a Kalamazoo-sized spill, the kind of spill that has already happened in other places, what the effect would be in Ottawa if that took place on the Rideau River. And we want to see the city actively participate in the National Energy Board review, even if the National Energy Board review has been gutted and turned into a mockery by the current federal government. From the municipal government, we, from the provincial government, we want to see them stand up and say no to this. They are, Ontario is part of Canada. We are part of a national energy policy. We have to take responsibility <coughs> for our role in Canada, and we have to tell our province that the answer is no in terms of us being complicit in this pipeline. The Ontario government has done a good thing. They've created a separate set of hearings through the Ontario Energy Board that's never been done before, and we support that. The first round happened last week. They're still taking comments until April 30th on the first round of hearings from the Ontario Energy Board, and I would ask everybody to please um, send in comments to the Ontario Energy Board, and they're going to be back in town, and let's tell them, let's tell them what, we, uh, what we think. But we definitely want the Ontario government to stand up and there's going to be an election soon and now is the time to tell them that. And from the federal perspective, we also want the federal, we also want the federal government to say no to this pipeline. And we have to understand that by the time this pipeline actually comes before <coughs> the federal cabinet, the current government, whether it's conservative, NDP, liberal, whatever, will not be in power. There will be a new government that will have formed, an election will have happened. So the time to organize is now and the timing is right. I want to tell you two quick things that we're doing. First of all, as soon as this pipeline was announced, we started a petition to stop the Energies Pipeline. And the petition is quite clear. It just says, we call on all of our elected leaders to say no to this pipeline. 
And we do this for two reasons. The first, the first reason is the petition provides people with an easy way to have their voice heard. An easy way to say, no, I don't want this, not in my name. The second reason is the petition is a way that we find our friends. And make no mistake, there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people across this city who care about climate change, who care about the, who care about the role the tar sands are playing in destroying, in destroying communities and in undermining land and livelihoods and, and driving climate change. There are hundreds of thousands of people who support that, but we have to get out and we have to find them. In the same way that in Kitty Mat, they went out and they went door to door and they found people and they said, we want you to vote no for this pipeline. We have to get out and we have to take this petition to people's doors, to fairs, to festivals and say, join us, this is important, now is the time. And when they sign that petition, they get on our list, it's thousands strong and it's growing every day and we are slowly piecing together a movement that is capable of stopping this. The second thing, The second thing I want to talk about is when this pipeline was announced, it just so happened that there was a by-election that was about to be held in Ottawa South. So Ecology Ottawa and a lot of volunteers, we'd already printed up door knockers, basically things you hang on doors, warning people about this pipeline, and we took to the streets. We had, we had what, about 50 volunteers who came out and we, we put thousands and thousands of door knockers on doors across the Ottawa South Riding at a provincial level. Right now there is one sitting member in the Legislative Assembly in Ontario, one member of provincial parliament who stood up and said, I would oppose this and any project that threatens the health of that community and that member is the member who won in Ottawa South, John Fraser. And he did it because people were organizing in his community. And that's what we're going to be doing over the next year. That's what we're going to be doing over the next two years. We're going to be organizing in communities. We're going to be taking the door knockers, the petitions, door to door. We're about to have uh, lawn signs printed up. We want people to put their flag in their front yard and say no to the energy's pipeline. We're going to be organizing around the Ontario Energy Board. And I'm going to end with this because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what's most important is that people who care about these issues take the time to do those things that so few of us do. We spend so much time in this movement talking to each other. We spend so much time in this movement shuffling emails back and forth between each other, between people who are already convinced that there is a problem. But the way we make change is we get out of our comfort zone and we get out onto the streets and we start talking to people whose opinions we don't already know. The point is not to get out there and convince people that are diehard opposed to us. The point is to get out there and find our friends, to engage them in a meaningful conversation about how we can work together and to piece together a movement that is not only capable of, of stopping this pipeline, but is capable of changing the dangerous and reckless trajectory that our energy policy and our civilization is on today. And together we can do that. Thank you very much.